Hello, my name is Brenda Little, and I am a member of the Cheyenne League of Women Voters. With me today is Ms. Tamara Trujillo, who is running for, I believe, re-election for um, House District 44. So Ms. Trujillo, before we get started, I would like to have you introduce yourselves to the folks who'll be watching yourself, to the folks who will be watching this video. Um, can you please tell us how long you have lived in Cheyenne? How has your personal and professional background and experience prepared you for this position? What elected or appointed positions have you held? And please describe your civic or volunteer involvement and what motivated you to rerun for this position? Ms. Trujillo? Um, Tamara Trujillo, rep current representative for House District 44. Uh, I've actually, we my family moved to Wyoming in 1978. Um, the railroad brought my dad, Union Pacific brought my dad here. And we lived in railroad housing out of Harriman, Wyoming until about 1983 when we moved to Cheyenne. Um, I actually bought the house I grew up in from 1983. I bought it nine years ago. Uh, for my dad so he can retire from the railroad and move back with his siblings to enjoy his retirement. Um, after high school, I graduated from Central High School in 1993. And after that, I married a Navy guy and I was a military spouse for many years. And I actually got to travel the United States in that, in that role. So I lived on the East Coast for many years in Florida Um, after that, I ended up taking care of my grandma for a few years in New Mexico. And then it came time to actually uh, support my family and my children. And as a single parent, I came back home to Cheyenne where um, I felt it was probably the best environment to raise my kids. So I raised my three, my three kids here. They got to go to the same elementary school I went to. Uh, my daughter was first graduating class of South. My son graduated from South and my last daughter just graduated from South. Um, I've been a volunteer mom. So civic duty as a single parent, it's really hard to fit in working full time and taking care of kids. So I was the team mom. I was transporting not only my kids, but other kids from the teams because other parents worked or had sick kids at home. So I felt that my civic duty at that time in life was helping other families in support of their children being in after school sports. Um, once my kids got older, I am now involved with Habitat for Humanity and I am a child advocate for, or I'm a CASA advocate. I don't know if you know what CASA means, but we're court, appoint, court appointed to help with those functions of um, taking care of our kids in the state. Um, Let's see what else. Uh, my my reasoning for running for office two years ago and continuing to run for office is uh, growing up on the south side and seeing how our infrastructure has been neglected for so many years. And with all the new growth coming in, I want to make sure that my district is taken care of. We have a lot of middle class and low income families that you know, can't afford when water backs up into their yard or when we have dripping water in our sinks to fix part of government's responsibility is infrastructure and safety. And so I just want to make sure that my district is taken care of. Very good. Thank you, Ms. Trujillo. And now the first of our four questions for you what specific policies or reforms do you think Wyoming could effectively implement to reduce healthcare costs for the uninsured 
and underinsured. So there's a couple things that I've learned in these past couple years for the uninsured and underinsured is, you know, Wyoming doesn't have Medicaid expansion. And because Wyoming is one of maybe two or a handful of states that don't have it, I don't see where we're promoting that there are rebates available to Wyoming citizens for Obamacare. For instance, we don't have Medicaid expansion, but you can go and you can qualify for Obamacare. And yeah, it, it, it'll look like it's going to cost you anywhere between two to $3,000 a month. But what we don't tell you, what the insurance people are failing to explain is Wyoming qualifies for rebates. So your, your, re, your uh, monthly deductible isn't going to be the $3,000 a month. Depending on your income, you can actually qualify for a decent insurance coverage for under $100 a month. So I think... Um, we need to see more promotion of that. Granted, the rebates may come to an end, I think, at the end of 2025. But as we know how federal government works and most of government rebates work, there's always a continuation of that, especially for states that don't promote Medicaid expansion. So right now in Wyoming, we have anywhere between, I wanted to say on the article, it was 20 to 40,000 people mm -hmm that are already using this program. And I think by promoting this for short-term processes, it would help a lot more people if we would just help people understand how this rebate program works. And going forward, maybe the state can also look into certain aspects of that. I know we've raised the low income bracket up to, I think, 200%. Um, and really, it's just promoting the programs that we have would really be cost effective to a lot of the citizens in the state. Thank you. Thank you. And um, our second question for you, what accountability and performance measurement standards should be required for all public, private, and charter schools? Public and private charter schools, you know, we should all have the same measurements at the end of the day, which is, you know, Tom, uh, considering the overall academic performance of the schools, different indicators, you know, um, reading, math, the financial health of how to be an adult in society, as for profit entities and private schools, probably um, holding to the I don't know the <laughs> I need you know, can I rephrase this statement because it's really hard because we're bound by so many federal requirements that in order for us to require you know. It's, it's ever changing, but um, I think reevaluating our testing programs and how we sit in the classroom with our kids would be, I don't know this question. I'm sorry. <laughs> that, that, go ahead. Um, I, if, if you'd like, yeah, I can... uh, that's a hard question. Yeah. It, it... <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to go ahead and, and th this may help. I'm going to go ahead and ask you a, just a, a quick phrase. Um, and I would like to get your reaction to this phrase. And it is election savings account. I'm sorry. I said the word wrong, Mr. Heo. Education savings account. I was like, election savings account. I don't think yeah. we don't want that. I apologize. <laughs> no, you know, I believe that there should be an election savings account. I'm, I'm a, I well, love public school. Yeah. So I meant education savings account. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, 
I'm, I love public school. My kids go to public school. My grandkids go to public school. And I believe in supporting our public schools. But I also believe that we need an education savings account because there are a lot of people right now with the way that our public education is going towards indoctrinating children that we do need this account so they can have the option of charter schools or other options, you know, online education. And none of that is cheap. I also do know that our taxes do need to take care of our communities. So, you know, it's just finding that equal ground. Thank you very much. Um, here is our third question for you. What infrastructure investments do you think are necessary to support the state's long-term economic growth? Say that one more time, I'm sorry. You bet. What infrastructure investments do you think are necessary to support the state's long-term economic growth? Well, when we look at the infrastructure and for why Wyoming's growth, and specifically to Laramie County and my district, um, we need to focus on the water and sewer supply to our communities and not just building new communities, but investing in the upkeep of our older communities. House District 44 is a very old community and we have new data centers and we have a refinery in our area that is using up a lot of water. And I don't know if they forgot that the water has to pass through certain neighborhoods to get to these businesses, but they're not paying attention to that infrastructure for my neighborhood. And to me, if we're gonna grow into a bigger ind industry and bring these big companies, we need to make sure that we're taking care of the community that they have to go through to get to those businesses. So making sure that not only new, but our older communities have the proper water and sewer facilities is um, the infrastructure we need to pay attention to. And that, that also goes to our, our rural communities, making sure that their water tanks and water facilities are also up to par for the community. I mean, water is essential to the people and it should be more essential to the people's homes rather than a, than a billion dollar business. Thank you. And now your uh, final of uh, the um, questions. How would you engage in constructive dialogue with those who have opposing views? Well, what I've learned in the past two years is constant communication with those with opposing views. Um, I went into the legislature new, not knowing any sides of how the how the government works, and I was already placed on in a section. It felt like being in high school, and. The way I combated that is always, you know, going into a conversation, asking questions, trying to get involved, um, asking to be included, giving my ideas when the opportunity arose. And even after being shunned by a lot of the Wyoming caucus people, I um, still continue to try and learn and engage in the conversations. Um, you know, I was I was approached with fingers in my face and hostility by a lot of the longtime establishment. And um, I still try to make a conversation every day with them, participating in our morning, you know, shaking of hands. And, you know, I won over quite a few people that way because it was it was their. their own personal opinion, I suppose, of what has been said that, well, okay, let's put it this way. Um, once they get to know me, they realize that I don't participate in one side or the other because I am 
from a very district 44 is very diverse and in order to represent them i cannot pick one side or the other because i do have a mix of everybody in my district so making sure that people know that that's how i vote is according to my voting record it's it's a proven fact that i vote for house district 44 and the people it's just you know sometimes they'll call me difficult because i'm standing for the people i'm not standing for government so making sure that you know we are a people's government we're not we're not a gov government's government <laughs> I don't know how else to say that. Thank you, thank you. I'm gonna ask you one more of these flash feedback phrases and I would like your reaction to it. Election security. Election security. <laughs> I think we need better election security. Um, asking somebody to identify themselves with an ID is not voter suppression. That's actually promoting America first. Uh, in my previous election, we had um, people from the other party on social media You have frozen up on me. Can I ask you to start all over? Hi, sorry about that. So back to, um, you know, back when I was voter integrity, back when I was running a couple years ago, we had a group or a person online promoting that you didn't have to be a citizen, just live in the, in the county you're in to vote. So, you know, and that that post stayed on social media for six days. So when we talk about voter integrity, um, that's what we're fighting against. When you have actual people running for office in the state of Wyoming promoting that you don't have to be a citizen to vote. Well, that's what we're trying to prevent when it comes to voter integrity. Um, Pretty much that's all. I, I, I don't be, I believe we should have identification at the time to vote. Thank you. And now, um, Ms. Trujillo, I would like to get some closing remarks from you. Um, you have a couple minutes to let us know if elected, what do you hope to achieve? What is the greatest strength you bring to the position? And why should voters choose you over your opponents? Well, thank you for that, that question. And in closing, um, I ran for election based on looking at the budget, finding out where the money's being distributed and how it's being distributed. When I'm reelected, I plan to continue my education and learning the budget, not only to vote for my people, but for the state of Wyoming in a conservative manner when it comes to spending our money and how we should spend it. Um, I think I'm a better option for the fact that that's what I have been doing. My record, my voting record will show that I'm voting for the people and in a most conservative manner 
there's we don't have to raise more money or raise more taxes to do what we need to do if we look at our budget and spend it wisely. I'm a single parent mom. I raised my kids on my budget. And, you know, there's days where you can spend a lot of money and go on lavish vacations. And then there's days where you just need to rein in that spend, evaluate how you're spending it and reallocate your money. Um, I believe the state of Wyoming with, you know, we're bringing in new businesses, yes, but we're also losing a lot of our money with all these federal regulations on our natural resources. And we need to remember that that is how Wyoming makes their income. And if we're getting cut back on that stuff, then we need to re rein in our spend and figure out how we can spend it better on the people. Very good. Thank you. Not the government. Ah. So reelecting me, I, I will still be your voice for House District 44, not only with the state, but the city and the county. And, you know, I'm here for you. Thank you, Ms. Trujillo. And thank you for um, allowing us at, with the League of Women Voters to have a chance to meet you and get to know you. And uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much. You too. Thank you.